This is Anthony Morganti. Welcome to my podcast for the joy of photography. This is episode two of For the Joy of Photography. Thank you for joining me. In this episode, we're going to talk about the rules of composition. After I did last week's podcast, a couple people commented that they really would like me to cover the so-called rules of composition. Well, there's probably well over a hundred different rules of composition as they pertain to photography, so it's probably impossible to talk about all of them. It's definitely impossible to talk about all of them in one podcast, but I am going to talk about some of the more popular rules and what they mean and why you should consider using them. And that's probably where we're going to start right now is why should you consider using rules of composition? Well, typically, these different rules of composition help you create a more balanced, dynamic image. If you just took snapshots here and there with the elements in the scene not placed in the preferable points in the picture, your picture probably won't be as pleasing to look at. These rules of composition help you achieve that. And it really goes back a long time. I mean, probably the way our brains evolved. For example, why do you think a flower looks beautiful to most people, whereas a pile of dung looks revolting to most people. That is probably something that's really hardwired in our brain. And the ancient Greeks discovered this first, at least as far as I know, that if a scene is designed or uh, painted in a specific way, that it would be most appealing to a human eye. And they actually uh, involve mathematics uh, with it. You've heard probably of the golden ratio or the golden spiral, and this all involves math. But then afterwards, after the Greeks, um, then you probably saw or heard about painters incorporating these different types of rules of composition for their paintings. Uh, just a way for them to create a very balanced image that was compelling. Now, we as photographers would use these rules of composition for that reason. That is, we want to create a compelling, dynamic, interesting image. But also, we want to use the rules of composition to um, kind of guide our viewer to what we want them to notice in the image. And what I often mention uh, to aspiring photographers, your goal when you take a picture is you want to um, exemplify or you want to uh, really highlight the best parts of the scene. You want to make sure that those are noticed. Well, at the same time, you want to uh, diminish the parts of the scene that aren't as interesting. And the rules of composition can help you do that. So basically, you're going, to, you're going to exploit the best parts of the scene, and you're going to diminish the parts of the scene that aren't as compelling. Now, as I mentioned, there's hundreds of different rules of composition, and some might argue that some rules of composition are really uh, under an umbrella of another rule, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, whereas, you know, where other people would say that those are two distinct different types of rules of composition. Either way, it's good that you know at least the basics. The first rule we're going to talk about is the ubiquitous rule of thirds. This is the most common rule probably people learn about. And really uh, what it does, it allows you to... Uh, balance an image and make it look dynamic. Uh, with the rule of thirds, for those of you not familiar and those of you that aren't watching the video, you're listening to the podcast, 
it's really a tic-tac-toe board. So you're going to draw four lines, and you're going to draw each line uh, equidistant from each other. And so you're going to draw two vertical lines. The first vertical line, let's say, will go one-third of the way in from the left. The second vertical line goes two-thirds of the way in from the left. And then you're going to do two horizontal lines, one that is one-third of the way down from the top, and the other horizontal line is two-thirds of the way down from the top. And you'll have that tic-tac-toe board. And the idea here is you want to put key elements of the scene at least over one of those or more of those lines. Preferably, you'd like to get something that's very interesting at a point where the two lines intersect. So you're going to have four different areas of intersection where the horizontal line intersects with the vertical line. And you'd like to have uh, the most compelling thing at least over one of those intersection points, if possible. And when you do that, you'll find that the image uh, is more compelling. It's more pleasing to look at. Um, if you're taking an image of a person or a person is the scene, you'd usually like their eye, or at least if they're maybe further back in the scene, you'd like their head. Uh, in one of those points of intersection, uh, even an animal. It doesn't just go for people. It could be an animal. You'd like their eye, or if they're, again, if they're further away, their head to be right in one of those points of intersection. If you're just taking a landscape image without anyone in the shot, try tilting your camera up and put the horizon line along the bottom horizontal line of your rule of thirds. You're going to make the sky, um, you're going to be shooting the image with more of the sky in your frame than if you shot it straight on with the horizontal or with the um, horizon right in the middle of the frame. Now, I mentioned what you'd like to do is exploit the best part of the scene and diminish or try to um, not show off the parts of the scene that aren't as good looking. So if you have a landscape and you have a great sky that day, beautiful clouds, beautiful colors, then I would suggest you want to exploit that sky. So you would point your camera up and you would put the lower horizontal line along the horizon line so you're going to be showing off the sky. Conversely, if there's something very interesting at ground level and the sky isn't as compelling, you want to show off, exploit, the good part, which is down at the bottom, and you want to diminish the bad part, which is up at the top. So you might want to tilt your camera down in those instances for a landscape image. So the rule of thirds is, is the most common because it's the most easy to implement it. Implement. You could probably implement it for just about any type of image. Even if you're taking a senior portrait, you would just put your senior off center. You often hear maybe a photographer who's teaching saying do not bullseye your shot and really what they're saying or they're suggesting you do is you shoot with the rule of thirds put your senior off center and put one of those points of intersection on your seniors one of your seniors eye usually usually the eye that is closest to the camera and that will produce a most compelling image another compositional rule that is probably as common and as easy to implement as the rule of thirds is framing. Now with framing, it is exactly what it implies. You're going to be framing the subject uh, that is in the shot. Um, it could be as simple as you're inside a home shooting out a window, but you have the entire frame of the window in the shot and somebody is outside and you're framing them with the frame of the window. You could be, as those of you that are watching the video, you could be shooting through a chain link fence and the links of the chain are framing your subject. What you're doing here is you're really directing the viewer very strongly where you want them to look. So as soon as their eyes fall upon a picture that has a frame in it, they're going to look inside that frame. Now, what you have to guard against is you want to make sure that whatever is in that frame isn't boring. So you're framing for a reason. You're framing something that is very compelling. Um, the payoff has to be good for them to be trained 
or be pushed to look through that frame. If you're just framing nothing, it's not a compelling image and they'd be disappointed in the shot. Now, what I would say is you could combine framing with rule of thirds. Uh, you may not, in this case here, uh, those of you watching the video, I have the horizon line right in the middle. I could have maybe tilted up or down and had that horizon line in a different spot. Maybe that would have helped the image be more compelling with the frame going along with it. But that's where you experiment a little and you see what works for you. And again, you want to remember, you want to exploit the best part of the image and you want to diminish the worst part of the image or the scene. And framing is going to help you really focus your viewer's attention on the subject. Now, if you're shooting out a window or you're shooting through a chain link fence, those are what I call a hard frame. It's very obvious what that frame is. But really, framing shines when you have a soft frame. A soft frame is something that's not as obvious. You might just have a crowd of people with the subject in the middle, but the way the crowd is around the people and maybe around the way the background objects are behind the subject, you'll really kind of creating a frame. You're channeling the viewer's eyes onto the subject. And that's what I call a soft frame. So this could be, as I mentioned, a group of people. It could be, let's say, uh, overhanging tree branches. You could have those branches that are the tree trunks are on the left and right. The overhanging tree branches go along the top and the ground is at the bottom and that's a soft frame and you're going to have something compelling on the middle that you want people to look at and this is where in my opinion framing is at its best when it's used subtly like this uh, it really helps um, your viewer look where you want them to look and it's very easy to do again and something that you should look for uh, train your eye to see because it's easy to see the chain link fence and shoot through that or the window frame, but these soft frames aren't as obvious. So practice, see if you could see uh, something that will look well framed in this soft way and work on that. Again, this is something, again, you could combine with a uh, rule of thirds. Uh, if you come, often if you combine uh, various of the uh, different rules of composition, your composition will come back even stronger, come out to look even stronger. The next thing I wanna to talk to you about is leading lines. There's all different types of lines in photography. You have leading lines, and leading lines are just natural things in the image that help lead your viewer through the scene. And very easy to do. You just look for something that will lead uh, the viewer through your picture but you need that you need those lines to resolve on something interesting so don't have these lines just going through your image and they don't go to anything even partway interesting you want them to resolve on something that is going to be compelling for the viewer to look at so you're basically forcing the viewer to look at something make sure that it's worth their time so these are leading lines now Often, leading lines will converge off into the distance. That means they'll start to come together. And that helps channel the viewer's gaze through the image in a very specific way that you want them to look. Um, there's all different types of lines in photography, and leading lines are one of the more uh, compelling types of lines. The other type of line is a diagonal line. Often, you'd like to compose your scene so that the elements flow through the scene from one of the corners going towards the diagonal corner from that corner. Um, it's not always obvious, but often all you need to do is kind of move your camera in such a way so that the line um, that of whatever is in that scene seems to be coming from a corner and going to the diagonal corner. And this usually is a very compelling image as well. What I found is that most uh, people whose language is written left to right, top to bottom, 
uh, well, top to bottom doesn't matter, but left to right, they tend to favor an image that has a diagonal line that starts in the lower left-hand corner and goes up towards the upper right-hand corner. Um, it could be the upper left to the lower right as well. It's just, you know, that uh, people like, you know, that are used to that type of language that is written left to right are kind of looking towards the left-hand side of an image to start. If your language uh, goes right to left, then it might be different for you and for whomever you're sharing your images with. So that's just, you know, little, little things. Now, if you have rows of something, uh, try not to shoot those straight on. Try to turn them so they go diagonally through the frame. They don't necessarily have to come right from the lower left-hand corner up to the right-hand corner. It could be just slightly. It just makes the image more compelling to look at. Um, just something that's very easy to do. It's just the way you uh, tilt your camera and frame the scene. So diagonal lines are very, very powerful type of line in photography. And again, if you could combine diagonal lines with one other type or any other type of rule of composition like rule of thirds or maybe framing it will make your image even more compelling the next thing i want to talk about is uh, odd numbers the kind of rule of odd numbers usually images look more compelling if you had have an odd number of elements in the image so and image with one element in it usually will be more compelling to look at than an image with two elements. Whereas an image with three elements would be more compelling than two elements and more compelling than four elements. So it's just a rule of odd numbers. And you can see those of you that are watching this video on YouTube, I just have a simple image here of a guy reading a book, but right above him is a window. It's a cafe and there's two other people, um, just on their computers or listening to music and you could see that it's three people so it is an odd number if there was a fourth person in here it may not be as compelling as an image of an image usually three is very strong one and three when you start getting up to seven nine it doesn't matter anymore usually one or three so if you have a landscape and you have a choice of putting a single tree in the image or two trees try to frame it so you could get that single tree in there. Or if you have a choice of getting maybe three trees, try it with three trees. So odd numbers, odd number of elements. Now going hand in hand with odd numbers is triangles. Triangles are very powerful um, in photography. And in that image I described in which I'm showing in the video uh, with three people, if you draw a line from each of their eyes, you'll see that you're creating a perfect triangle. And in this case here, inside of that triangle is a sign that says wet paint. And a guy happens to be sitting on the bench. He's the lower part of that triangle. And he's sitting on that bench with the sign right behind him that says wet paint. So it's rather amusing. The triangle is, again, each of their heads. And if you just draw a simple line from head to head, you'll get the triangle. Inside of the triangle is something compelling, the sign that says wet paint. So we're kind of have two elements here. We have a very soft frame, very, very soft frame, and we have the three uh, heads that kind of go into a triangular shape. So look for triangles. Look for shapes in general, but triangles are very strong um, if you could find them in a scene. And again, this goes back to the way our brains are wired. For some reason, our brains... Now, not everyone, I should say. Not everyone is going to find this compelling. I mean, there's probably people out there that don't think flowers are beautiful or they don't think that a pile of, of poo is revolting. You know, people are different. Generally speaking, though, most people have a brain that is wired in such a way where these basic rules of composition will... Um, if an image is incorporating at least one of these basic rules of composition, that image will be interesting to them. And that's what you want. You want someone to look at your image and not so much think. You want them to feel. 
And these rules of composition help them actually just feel something when they look at your image, not necessarily have to think too much about it. If you just took an image haphazardly and had various elements all over the place, someone would look at it and since there's really no cues, no maybe um, triangle in it, there's no um, rule of thirds, there's no framing, there's no diagonal lines, there's no lines in general, they're probably going to have to think of what they're looking at. And if they're thinking, they won't enjoy it as much. It really has to hit them on an emotional level when they look at it. Um, and that's what these rules of composition, again, help you to do. Now, Another thing I'd like to talk about is depth. Obviously, photography is a two-dimensional medium. There's no real depth in a picture, right? Because it's just flat. But you could do a lot of things that will mimic or give the feeling a depth in your image. Now, a lot of these are independent rules, and some of them are under an umbrella of something else, meaning um, there's something called the rule of similarity. And if you look at this image that I'm showing in the video, and those of you that aren't watching the video, I'll describe it to you. There's a man walking uh, right to left. He's on the right side of the frame. He has a backpack. Um, he happens to be holding some food, and but his backpack and he's walking right to left. Off in the distance, slightly blurred, is another man. He's more to the left side of the frame. And he has a backpack, and he happens to be looking at the camera, or he might be looking at the man that is closer to the camera. Now, it's a rule of similarity. They're both walking from right to left. They're both they both have backpacks on, um, and they're you know just going about their day basically. But because the one similar object is off in the background, it gives depth because our brain is looking at it and obviously noticing the man that is in better focus, that is in the foreground. But then we notice the man that is in the background that is more out of focus and is smaller in the frame. They're similar, but if you looked at the men, they're very different men. They're very different looking men, but it's the law of similarity. They're both walking in the same direction. They have backpacks on, um, and it's something that um, gives your image the feeling of depth uh, to the shot. Now, again, there's all different ways you could accomplish depth in an image. Silhouettes often are a way to accomplish depth. You'll have something very dark in the foreground, and then the background, something bright, obviously. And you're metered on the bright thing so that anything in the foreground that is not as bright gets silhouetted. Now, this is, um, falls usually under something they call visual weight. Um, not always, but in the image, uh, those of you watching the video, this isn't a perfect example of visual weight, but often it will be what is called visual weight. You'll have something that dominates the scene, but something else that is smaller in the scene is sticking out for some reason. It's sticking out for one of many reasons. One reason will be contrast. It's real dark. And the other part that is dominating the scene is very light. So contrast is making that smaller object stick out. You're noticing that. That's called visual weight. That even though it's physically smaller, it has visual weight. Um, it could be that it has a different texture. Uh, something in the background may be smooth and fluffy and something in the foreground is prickly and hard looking. So there's that texture difference that could be a way to do it color you could have something that is a uh, very dark blue in the background and something that is bright orange in the foreground um, so you could have these uh, different ways to make things that normally would be lesser in the scene stand out in the case of this image here there's not as much visual weight as there is just adding depth to the scene. We have a Pollock painting in the background, which is a very large piece that is very brightly lit. But then in more in the foreground, we have a silhouette of four men, the back of them looking at the painting. So you get that depth. We have the uh, silhouette in the foreground the, that's dark, 
and the very bright painting in the background, which is light. So it's giving us this depth in the image and something you could look for. What I'd like you to do, it's impossible for me to talk about uh, thoroughly in a podcast, is just Google visual weight and you'll get some ideas of all the different ways you could achieve visual weight. I mentioned uh, color, texture, um, a tone, uh, contrast, but really there's probably about 10 other ways that you could achieve visual weight. And it's not always having something small stand out, but it's a way for you to make something that is compelling in the scene stand out in the scene against something else that isn't as compelling. So visual weight is a very, very powerful way to help you do that. It also is a way that you could really get some depth in the image. And I talk about visual depth. Again, that's kind of giving the illusion that your image is, is more than two dimensions. It's not just um, side to side, up and down. There's actually something going back into the computer screen or into the paper as you look at it, as you look at that image. Um, other ways you could achieve um, like this kind of visual depth I'm talking about is not only in the elements of the scene, but in a single element. For example, uh, those of you that watch my videos on processing images know that I often will, when I have a landscape image that has uniform green grass, that's boring to me. And I like to add some depth to it. And the way I usually go about doing it is I will go to the HSL panel and I will make the yellow in the HSL panel of Lightroom more saturated and lighter. And then I will make the green darker. And I don't make the saturation of the green any different. I leave that alone. So basically I'll take the green, um, a luminance slider in the HSL panel and move it to the left. Then I take the yellow luminance slider in the HSL panel and move it to the right. Then I go to the saturation panel and I take yellow and I move that to the right also. So what that does is it kind of makes the uh, grass a little bit yellow in spots, a little bit darker green in spots, and a little bit more medium green in some other spots. So it gives me visual depth just on the grass, sometimes in the trees. And that makes the image more compelling to look at. It works for black and white images as well. Uh, typically, if you would convert your image to black and white, the HSL panel in Lightroom turns, to the black and, turns into the black and white mix panel. And what I'll do there is I simply take the green slider down, I move it to the left, and I take the yellow slider and move it to the right. And it will give me that same um, separation of really the individual blades of grass. Some of the grass that may be a little more yellow becomes even more yellow, and some of the grass that is a little more green becomes even more green. In the black and white image, the yellow gets brighter and the black or the green gets a little darker. And it gives you visual weight. It really, um, it gives you depth. I'm sorry, not visual weight. So it just gives you that simple depth uh, to your image. Something that is very easy to do, uh, usually done in post, but you could look for it in a scene. If you see a scene um, that you could frame, but there happens to be um, a, gre a green grass, but there's a lot of yellow dandelions in it, then that's perfect. Just you would probably want to use maybe rule of thirds, point your camera down or keep your camera low, get a different perspective so that you have those um, dandelions and grass easily noticed. And that way uh, you'll add more depth to the scene because you're adding this color depth. If you turn it into black and white, you're adding tonal depth uh, to the scene. So again, something very easy to do and something that will make your image more compelling to look at. And finally, I just want to talk about negative space. Uh, sometimes that is uh, like the, one of the most compelling things you could do. You don't always have to frame everything perfectly so that every pixel represents something that is super interesting in the scene. 
sometimes you just want something that is interesting, but you want it surrounded by something that really is mundane, and it will help your subject jump out. Those of you watching the video, you could see that there's this image, and it's really nothing too compelling per se. There's a woman that I, I was street, doing street photography, and she happened to look my way, and I have her way down in the lower part of the image, and then the rest of the image is just the gray brick of the building. Um, not necessarily perfect negative space. Quite often you'd want your negative space to be more uniform. This is a little more varied, but it does qualify as negative space because it's really nothing there. There's nothing there to see. So it really forces the viewer to look at the subject, the woman in the picture. So it makes this rather mundane image a little more interesting to look at just because of the way I chose to frame it so that the mundane aspects of the scene dominate the scene. And the very interesting part is more towards the edge. That's another thing about visual weight. Sometimes you could make something more noticeable if it's more towards the edge of the frame. And you could see I framed it in such a way so that she is more towards the bottom left-hand corner of the frame. And that just makes it compelling to look at. So again, I think um, compositional rules are very important. I had a student along, well, not too long ago, and she said to me when I brought up compositional rules, I like to teach it early. I like to teach rules of composition early in someone's photography training. And she said, well, you know, rules are made to be broken. I don't really worry about composition rules. And um, I kind of giggled a little bit at her, I think. I said, you know, that's really taking the lazy way out. You really have to know and understand them so that you can break them for a reason. You really can't just say rules were made to be broken. You really have to understand them and then have a very good reason for breaking them. Maybe the reason will only be compelling to you, but at least you have a reason. Uh, that is very important that you learn compositional rules. And again, I can't go over all of them in a podcast. I went through the ones that aren't necessarily the most popular, although, the, you know, again, framing and rule of thirds, leading lines are super common. But tonal depth might not be as common. But these are ones that I use all the time. And again, I would say, I would encourage you to Google um, visual weight, read about that, Google diagonal lines, leading lines, converging lines, uh, Google, you know, photographic compositional rules, and you'll get a lot of articles talking about different rules of composition. Then go out and practice them and see how they could help you make more compelling pictures. Thank you for watching my podcast for the joy of photography. Remember, stop by my website, onlinephotographytraining.com. There you'll find all my latest videos and articles to help you improve your photography. That's it for now. I'll talk to you guys soon.